Welcome to the City Speak podcast. I'm Clarence Anthony. I'm CEO and Executive Director of the National League of Cities. You all don't know how honored I am and proud I am to be here today with our inaugural City Speak podcast. This has been a dream come true for our National League of Cities organization. Now, another dream come true is to be able to have my first guest, who is a friend that I've known for years, where I was a mayor and he was a mayor and we served in associations, the National League of Cities, U.S. Conference of Mayors, and that is Mitch Landrieu. He is a former mayor of New Orleans and now a senior advisor and infrastructure coordinator for the White House. Mitch Landrieu has served in the public his entire life. His whole family, it seems like it's in politics. His dad was mayor of New Orleans and a federal secretary of HUD. His sister is a former U.S. senator. So Mitch grew up in politics. He also grew up in New Orleans and was elected to the Louisiana State House of Representatives in 1987, where he served for 16 years before becoming lieutenant governor. He was elected to be mayor of New Orleans in 2010 and had the tough task of dealing with so many issues, including helping the city continue to recover and rebuild from Hurricane Katrina. Under Mitch, New Orleans came back strong. If there's one thing I know about Mitch, he knows how to build back communities stronger after a crisis. So when President Biden looked for someone who could really help local leaders understand how to implement the bipartisan infrastructure bill, he picked Mitch Landry. The bipartisan infrastructure law, which was passed November 2021, was just the first step of getting these dollars out to local communities. Now the real work begins. It gives cities an opportunity to repair their long broken infrastructure. It helps our local leaders not just rebuild our roads and bridges, but it helps us to adopt clean energy, fix our water systems, and much, much more. So he's going to bring that experience, he's going to bring that knowledge, and he's going to help local leaders to be able to use these dollars in the proper way. So, Mitch, welcome to City Speak. You are my first guest. I'm excited to see you. So thank you for being here. Let's get started. Thank you so much. You, you are a blessing in my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you and I have gotten to be friends and continue to be partners. And thank you for your leadership leading the National League of Cities, which has been so critical to, you know, really changing the country from the ground up and the middle out, as the president likes to say. So I'm thrilled to be with you today. So let me uh, build on how I open talking about, you know, your family and public service. You know, we can say it's in the genes. Uh, we can say it's you saw it and you say that too was for me. But what really got you interested in public service? You know, I'm, I'm one. My mom and dad are, you know, still with us today and have been great mentors in my life. And uh, you know, I can remember from the time that I was a baby that my my mom and dad just doing everything they could to help people. My dad was a lawyer. He did it through politics. He and my mother had nine children. In 11 years, I have a bucket load of family. And we have, between us all, we have 38 nieces and nephews. Um, and really, for my brothers and sisters that are involved in government, and those that are not, just, you know, my mom and dad's ethos has been help other people. Be fair, help out, you know, and, uh, and you have an obligation to, to lead, not just, not just to follow. And so I was able to watch my dad in politics and my mom in her community service. And it was just something I kind of felt like I always wanted to do. So when I got out of law school, um, you know, I, uh, my wife and I met in law school and we got married. And I just, that that's kind of the tact that I felt like best situated me to help other people. Um, and on top of that, I just wanted to have something to say about the rules that people were making that, that, I, that I had to follow. I, it never really sat well with me to let somebody else make the rules and me not have anything to say about it. And so, you know, um, and as you mentioned, that throughout my life, I served 16 years in the state legislature. And then I became the lieutenant governor of the state of Louisiana. And while I was at Katrina hit, you know, we lost 250,000 homes, 1,800 people. 
you know, you have to run to that fire. You can't run away. When you called, you just got to go. And uh, that kind of just, you know, was part of, of what we learned as as kids. And, it, and it's followed me into my adult life. So if you think about that a little bit, you know, public service is, is a challenge sometimes. I mean, it's not for uh, the weak at heart. As you compare the state level, the federal level, how has serving as mayor shaped your view and your role? Because you've you've done all of them. So now, how has it shaped your role? Well, you know, it's interesting. Everything that you learn in your life, whether it's in government, outside of government, trains you for the position that you're in. You know, when I played baseball when I was a little kid, you know, I learned how to work with other people. I was a theater kid. I loved doing shows. And it required you to, you know, work with other people um, and, and ensemble cast. When I became a, a lawyer, I learned how to think, you know, critically, uh, take both sides of the argument, see somebody else's side that you completely disagree with. As a matter of fact, having to argue on their behalf, <laughs> even if you disagreed with them because of. Uh, so that that helped a lot. But when I, I was a uh, on the state, local, and federal level, I've now worked on all three, but I've also worked in different branches of all of those. I was a law clerk for the Supreme Court Justice of Louisiana. Um, so I worked, and, and I was also a law clerk for a federal district court judge. So I worked in the judiciary. I had an opportunity to work in the legislative branch on the state level. I had an opportunity to work in the executive branch on the state level. Then I went back and became an executive on the city level. And now, of course, I'm working in the executive branch on the federal level. And so there are a couple of things that I that I learned uh, from that. First of all, being a legislator, as opposed to an executive, um, you, you know, you, your job is to advocate. Your job is to really push hard, find consensus around a piece of legislation. But most legislators think that once they pass the legislation, the job is over. And that's really what I learned when I was an executive, that that was just the beginning, all right? So then I jump over and I become a lieutenant governor of the state and I become an executive and I, need, I learn how to, how to do stuff on the, on the state level. Then I became an executive on the city level and state and cities are very different. Um, when you're the mayor, as you know this, because you were a mayor, I would have to say that the mayor's job is probably the most complex. It's probably the hardest for a number of different reasons. One, you are where the rubber meets the road. You are the final decision maker and your decisions are very close to the ground. And and because you're not so high up, you see people every day and they can get to you. You know, if you're a governor, you're a president, you got security surrounding you. You're generally living in a in, in a place that's got a fence around it and you get two people, but it's not quite as immediate. So um, the reverberation is really, really quick and the pitches are fast and the challenges are hard. Um, and when you get up on on the on the executive branch of the federal level, you're 40,000 feet up and you're making policy, but now you've got to get it all the way down to the ground. And what I learned as a, as a mayor um, is, is uh, different from Washington speak. There's no Democratic or Republican way to fill a pothole. People just want their stuff done. <laughs> and so Washington has this way of being ideologically argumentative. I like to tease that some people in Washington like to, like to fight about what time of day it is. <laughs> <laughs> but but when you're building stuff and you're making stuff happen as a mayor, you got to get to the answer and it's got to be a common sense answer. It's not that people don't have passion, you know, but you got to get to an answer that works um, in real time. And that brings a certain sense of urgency to your work. And I'm trying to bring that to the federal level. As the president has said, get this money down to the ground quick. I'm trying to break down the silos in Washington trying to communicate clearly with the governors, making sure the governors are, are talking to the mayors and everybody's getting on the same page because everybody for the most part agrees that waiting in traffic is a pain in the neck or running on a bad road or having, you know, crossing uh, unsafe railroad tracks or not being able to get from point A to B because the bridge is broken. Almost everybody in America with all the craziness that we have going on right now can agree that we need to fix our infrastructure. Now, when you get outside of the Beltway and you have this these conversations, what are you hearing uh, from municipal leaders as well as state leaders? Because you are managing all of this about the infrastructure bill. 
I have been, look, I'm not a Pollyanna. We got, we've got tremendous challenges in this country, but I have been overwhelmingly joyful about the fact that all of the governors, and I've spoken to almost every one of them, and the ones that I haven't personally spoke to, I've spoken to the chiefs of staff, and over 250 mayors, as you know, you've helped me do this through, and, and lead us of towns and counties. There is a lot of common ground on what needs to be done, how it needs to happen, and the fact that we got to do it sooner rather than later. I am finding wherever I go that, that we're, we're beginning, not surprisingly, because this is the first time we've had this kind of money flowing through the system this quickly, um, challenges, which, which I just basically call opportunities. One of them is technical assistance. So small communities don't necessarily have the wherewithal to know what's in the bill, what's not in the bill, how do I get it? If I got the money, how do I get it onto my, you know, onto the corner in a community in my town? That's one issue. The other one is on workforce development. And I just, I've got a, I got a personal, my, from my personal experience, I have observed as a state legislative mayor, lieutenant governor, and now senior advisor for the president, that the country has not really done a great job in the last 50 years of creating a workforce development pipeline. It's kind of been ad hoc. Um, and we haven't done anything this big. So now we've got to figure out how to take advantage of this incredible opportunity to put everybody in America back to work and to train them in a way where they have a high paying job, you know, that makes a lot of sense. No, I, I think that's right. And as a small city, former small city mayor, as you go out there and you speak to these mid-sized small cities, these council members and, and, and mayors, and they talk to you about the challenges that they have, what kind of advice do you give them? Because again, one point, Two trillion, over four hundred grant program opportunities. Where do I start when I don't? My city, my my city manager is the city treasurer as well as the public works director. Right. You know, what do you, what do you tell them? Well, we reckon, you know, very early on, you and I talked, and we recognize that the federal government can look so far away, um, and pe people don't know where to look. So the first thing we did was put together a comprehensive document that folks can find at Build. B-U-I-L-D, build.gov. And it sets out all of the programs. There are 375 programs, 125 of them are new. Essentially, what it explains is that of the $1.2 trillion, half of it is going to the Department of Transportation to rebuild roads and bridges and airports and ports, waterways. The other half of it is going to uh, the Department of Interior, uh, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of the Environmental Protection Agency to do clean air and clean water to really prepare us for a clean energy future um, and high speed internet, all it explains who has all that stuff. The other thing that it explains is that half the money is basically going to the governors through the regular portals. Um, and then the other half is gonna be competitive. So if you're a small city or town, you gotta be thinking about a couple of things. One. And this is, going to be a, this is going to be a forcing function for collaboration. Governors and mayors, congressmen and senators have to get on the same page about what their priorities are in the state. That's number one. The second thing they have to think is how can I work regionally? Now, the reason why regional cooperation is important is because we're not just building a road or a bridge in a city or a town. That is happening. But there are bigger things happening. For example, because we're going to electric cars, we have to lay down 500,000 electrical vehicle charging stations. These are the places where you pull over and you stick the hose into the, <laughs> into the thing and, and fill your car up so you can go a couple more miles. You know, mayors have to map out where those are going to go, but those don't stop at the county line. So you got to think about the regional counties and it doesn't stop on the state line. We're actually fortifying the electric grids. So the energy companies that cut across states sometimes, they have to be talking to each other. On the high-speed internet, we want to lay down fiber optic cable everywhere in the country. Um, we, those require regional cooperation. So those cities, towns, counties that are working with their federal folks and with their state folks, they're the ones who, on the competitive side, are going to wind up getting there faster. So it's going to force regional collaboration, which is the second thing. And then finally, on the third piece of it, there will be, there will be individual competitive grants that are giving out and the better people are prepared, the more they know, the more technical assistance they have, and the more they understand that the president wants to build a better America that includes equity, includes products that are made in America, includes making sure that we pay in good wages to folks for, for honest day's work, 
and that we're preparing ourselves for climate, resilience, sustainability, cybersecurity. Those are all the areas where the country is trying to invest themselves because remember, we're building the backbone of the economy for the 21st century and we're doing it. We have 5,000 programs going on, right? 5,000 projects going on right now. We've pushed $110 billion out of the door already in the last six months. So we're hitting the ground running and we're going fast. But as you said, it's a $1.2 trillion piece of pie. So this is a, 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 a two, three, five, seven year program. It's not a, can you give me money and, and, and you know have it finished by tomorrow deal. It's gonna take some time to get it done. As you ex- talk about the infrastructure bill, uh, you get so enthusiastic and, and I could just see your, feel your smile and your face around it. What parts of the bipartisan infrastructure bill are you most proud of? You talk about equity, you talk about climate. You know, what, when you think about it, you're like, whoa, this is the piece that if I was still mayor, I would focus on. <laughs> well, look, I'd be like a pig in slop if I was still the mayor. I love it. <laughs> and the reason why is because when you're the mayor, you're not building a thing. You're not just building a road. You're trying to build a place. You're trying to rebuild a home. Remember, my orientation is my city got beat to death from Katrina. And when I say beat to death, I mean, everything went away. So when you build back a neighborhood, people in that neighborhood forgot. You take it for granted that that street that's outside your house, you know, and the electricity that runs under it or the sewer and water, or there's a store right across the street and there's a school right down the street. You know, or you actually have a car and there's a gas station. When all that stuff's gone and you got to put it back, you're building a neighborhood, you're building a place, you're building a home. So I had frustration when I was mayor getting the federal government to get everything I could get from them down to the ground at the same time. So if you ran up to Washington and you said, oh, man, I need to get a school. Let me go see the Secretary of Education. Oh, I got to get a house. Let me go see the Secretary of HUD. Oh, I got to get, you know, a business. Let me go to the Secretary of Commerce. That was frustrating. So when now that I'm up on the top, what I'm trying to do is make sure all those federal agencies are coordinated so that the mayor's got to go see one of them. Right. That's what the infrastructure task force is about. And to see what are all the tools that I have in all of the different departments so that I can get that money to the ground and rebuild my community in a way that makes sense. Now, here's here's what I get excited about. It's not just the thing that we're building, the road, the bridge, the airport, fiber optic cable, cleaning up brownfield, super fun sites. It's the way that it can get done. And that's the coordination between the federal, state and local governments and the, the value with which we're gonna build. So when New Orleans got beat to death after Katrina and we had to build it back, the question was, well, what are you gonna put back? Now, everybody, because we were in pain and trauma, and this is universally true after every major disaster, everybody just wants to close their eyes, say their prayer, open their eyes and hope it didn't happen and get back to right the way you were before, before the thing hit you. But the truth of the matter is that if you take a minute and ask yourself, The night before Katrina hit, was New Orleans perfect? Were we good? How did we do the last 30 and 40 years? And we think about building back. You might want to sit for a minute and say, you know what? We've got this terrible tragedy that happened to us. And we have this terrible, this wonderful responsibility. But we also have an opportunity. What is the opportunity? And the opportunity is not to put it back like it was. Maybe it's to build it the way it should have been if you would have gotten it right the first time. So now you're in a value conversation with yourself and say, well, what are our values? And the president has answered that question for the country. He says his values are when he wants to build a better America, that now that we have this money and now that we want to build for the 21st century, we have to build in a way that no one is left behind. Race is really important. Geography is really important. Um, The relationship between folks is important. Nobody gets left behind. I don't want to build from the bottom, from the top down. That's trickle down. That don't work. I want to build from the bottom up and the center up. That will take you in one direction. The other trickle down takes you in another in another direction. So he wants to think about equity. He also says, look, in case anybody hasn't noticed, we're, we're, we're too dependent on other countries. Uh, our manufacturing base left us. We know that we're part of the global economy, but we want to start making stuff here in the United States. And we want to make it with American products. That's the way to put people back to work and to build generational wealth. So that's the That's the second value, how we're going to build back better. The third is that we got to start paying people good. Now, this president is is unabashedly pro-union and thinks the union, 
built the middle class and middle class built America. So he wants to make sure that people have the right to organize. They can they can battle for themselves and get good benefits. And then the third, the fourth thing is we've got this climate challenge that's coming our way. That's here already. Last week, the wildfires in New Mexico, you had the tornadoes that cut across Appalachia. I, I don't need to go into proving to everybody that it's already here. And so as we're building back, don't build it back the way if a storm comes, it's going to blow it down right away. Build it up higher, build it up stronger, build it with material that's climate friendly and think a little bit about cybersecurity, you know, and whether or not we can protect ourselves. So when you start thinking about building back better, you get real excited about the possibilities of really building for the future. That's why I get juiced up about it. And if, and again, like I said, any mayor in America, any governor ought to be like a pig in slop thinking, man, I finally have a president that understands he's a partner. We finally got enough money to get started. We got enough flexibility and we've got a team of people that want to work together. Let's just get after it, you know, and make this happen and not look back. You know, that's interesting you say that because, you know, when the pandemic hit here in March of 2019 in local government, I'll say that many of the leaders were saying, I can't wait to get back to normal. I can't wait till we return back to normal. And now there's really a great opportunity to reimagine your communities, to look at data and look at the gaps that exist in your community in regards to infrastructure, water issues, wastewater issues, broadband. And our opportunity right now is not to look back, but really to build back better, as you indicated. And so I'm excited about how you are reaching out to, again, those cities in America to make sure that they understand that that's what we want uh, in America. But, but Clarence, let me let me speak to that just for a second. You know, when you when you uh, again, my my entryway into this massive rebuild came from Katrina. And I, I was unfortunately a part of this catastrophic event. And, and I can't I can't even describe how incredibly difficult and bad it was for all of us in 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 uh in the South and the rest of the country reached down to help us. And generally what I viewed from that was that people were in trauma for a long time. So many people got sent out of New Orleans to Atlanta and to Houston and the rest of the country was lovely in, in picking us up. Um, and what I noticed is that when a catastrophic event occurs, people just really want to act like it didn't happen and want to get back to normal as quickly as possible because of the traumatic event. So that is an understandable thing. And, and, and you saw this with COVID. Everybody just was like, man, can I just please get the hell out of here? Leave me to hell alone and let me get back to where I need to be and get out of my house because I'm tired of my family. You know, well, I'm, I'm joking, but you understand what I'm saying. No, I'm not going there with you. No, no, no. Nope. <laughs> Everybody's saying we've been too close too long. But 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 it is true though that that this does present. And I, and I say these words because they're very closely together. One great opportunity seems a little bit exploitive, but a higher responsibility to, to take a minute to think about whether you could have done it better and an opportunity to explore that, both responsibility and opportunity together. And if you think about it like that, a kind of responsibility and opportunity to kind of push up against each other and, 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 and cause you to start thinking more deeply about who you are and to make a more intentional decision about how you want to go forward. And then if you're empowered, this is where the money comes in. If you have if you have responsibility of opportunity and then you have money and power to do it, then, man, you got to get excited about the possibility of creating and thinking about ways to unleash what America could be if we would just get it right. You know, we've gotten it wrong in so many different areas and right in so many different areas. What if what if you wait for once in your life, all of the things lined up where we could really positively as a country across race, across creed, across color, across party, just kind of get it right so that we can win the 21st century and then have nobody else catches with the right values. That's exciting. That that is exciting. And I, you already talked a little bit about all of the infrastructure projects that are already going on in local communities and the broadband and the wastewater and the bridges. And that's exciting. One of the things I'd like to ask you to talk about, and I think people are interested in, is how the administration is seeking to fix 
uh, supply chain disruptions and price inflation, especially on the impact of uh, infrastructure projects. What are, yeah. we, what are you doing? Well, a couple of things. First of all, Putin's war in the Ukraine and COVID, um, two catastrophic and traumatic events have thrown the world uh, into disarray. And as a consequence of that, prices are going up for folks. Um, and because of COVID, supply chain stuff is disrupted because a lot of our stuff was not made here. So from the infrastructure side, which again is a long-term three, five, seven, what we're trying to do is get as much money down to the ground as quick as possible into ports and airports, waterways and rail, so we can move goods from where they are to shelves, to people's homes quickly. That's, that's what we're doing on the infrastructure side. On the, on the lower and cost side, outside of the BIL, the president of the United States, as you know, is working every day because inflation is his number one uh, priority to get the Fed to do that job to lower inflation. And then to ask Congress, while the Fed is doing that, to lower the cost to everyday Americans for the things that matter to them, childcare, prescription drugs, health care, you know, and make and make everybody's lives a lot easier. And then finally, um, gas. I mean, gas prices are up two dollars from the time Russia invaded the Ukraine because Russia was a major source of oil. Everybody in the world needs it. And, you know, supply and demand moves you in a different direction. As it relates to infrastructure, the higher the cost things are, the th things don't go as far. And so we're thinking about ways to make sure, at, again, because this is a three, five, seven year program, when that's when those prices start to go down, we're trying to really think about what this looks like going into the future. Um, I'm hoping beyond hope if we if we get half our job done right, future presidents, future congresses will add on to this down payment, this historic down payment that President Biden made. Remember, for 50 years, people have been talking about this. You and I talk about infrastructure week every week. <laughs> when the last guy was in there, we were talking about it the week never came. <laughs> so now. We're going to be an infrastructure decade now because the president was able to bring together a bipartisan group of legislators and put down on the table what I call receipts. I mean, a real $1.2 trillion. And by the way, every governor in this country already knows how much money they're going to be getting over the next five years so they can plan it in their budgets um, and get to work right away. So look for three to five years. I know you believe in seizing an opportunity that you have to make an impact. What do you want to see in America as an outcome uh, of this investment of $1.2 trillion and your role in it? Well, first of all, I'm honored to play what, whatever role I have, big, small, uh, indifferent. I mean, there are a couple of things. One of them is just from being a person that believes in government's ability to be an important part of creating a better future for the country. I wanna make sure that we learn in this country how to work together again between the federal, state, and local governments and to get the way right, the way we allocate, the way we appropriate money, the way we allocate money, and how quickly we can get it to the ground to build something that's important to all of us, whatever that might be. I want us to build a new muscle memory in this country about how to learn how to do big things together again. That's one outcome that I hope will override everything that we build. Secondly, I think that uh, within a reasonably foreseeable future, um, we have everybody in this country has access because of necessity to high-speed internet. This president and the vice president understand that knowledge is the great equalizer. And if you don't have access to knowledge, if you don't have access to information, you can't play in this economy. And I think with this particular bill, uh, the president, the vice president want to level the playing field on access to information. So if you're a little kid that's in the lower ninth ward or you're somebody sitting on the stoop in the hollows of Kentucky or you sitting in a tribal community in Alaska and you get access to knowledge, all of a sudden we're going to get the benefit of your joy and your brilliance for what you're going to create. So that's going to be really critically important. The other thing that's going to be exciting is um, the creation of a new clean energy economy. Everybody knows that this is where we got to go. And we need to get that sooner rather than later. And there is a huge investment coming through the Department of Energy to get everybody thinking of how we get to zero emissions in a reasonably short period of time. So our planet, you know, is 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 still here and we're in a livable space that makes a lot of sense. That's exciting. And then finally, hey, man, just the meat and potatoes. Give me a street to ride on that smooth. 
Look, my mom, my mom is up on me every day. She used to get mad at me because she would say when, when I was the man, you know, my street's too bumpy. I can't get to the doctor on time. I got to go around. Then, then she started getting her street repaved. And then she got aggravated that it was taking too long because they were paving her street. And I said, mom, you can't complain <laughs> when your street's not getting fixed and then complain when your street is getting fixed. And this is what she said to me. She said, Mitchell, I'm your mother. I can have it whatever way I want. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so for those of us, Mayor, you know this, when you're on the ground making it happen, somebody's going to grab you by the ear and remind you that they knew you when you were a baby and you needed to get straight. And so I have that thing in my head about hurry up and get it done. Well, I can tell you, I got more mama stories coming to my city commission meeting uh, that <laughs> we have to share over uh, drinks or dinner one day. But let me tell you something. First of all, thank you so much for being uh, the first episode of Cities Speak uh, with National League of Cities podcast. And I appreciate your leadership and commitment and your friendship uh, to all of us in cities, towns, and villages and personal friendship. And with that, Mitch Landrieu, we thank you. And I'm going to drop the mic on the first episode of City Speak. Thank you. Clarence, thanks for having me. I loved it. All right. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to City Speak with Clarence Anthony. If you like the show, let us know. Share this episode with your friends and make sure to subscribe. We're curious to hear what you think, what you want more of, and how we can improve. If you have feedback or an idea for a guest you'd like Clarence to sit down with, send us your thoughts at citiespeakpodcast at nlc.org. Join us next month for a new episode. Like and subscribe here or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.